Let's move on to exploit exercise deck level 5. You should have watched the previous videos to understand how we got here. The challenge description says, Stack 5 is a standard buffer overflow, this time introducing shellcode. And the hints are that it might be easier to use someone else's shellcode, and that is also what we will do. And if debugging the shellcode, use the int3 instruction with the opcode hex cc to stop the program executing and return to the debugger. And that is very helpful. Okay, let's have a look at this code. It's surprisingly small. There's just one function called to gets, which we know allows us to overwrite data on the stack. So how do we get from no functionality of the program to a root shell? So put on your wizard's hat because we will do some magic. So put on your wizard's hat because we will do some magic. Let's open this program in GDB and let's just throw a long string against it. To do that, let's already prepare our exploit script. So first we want to find the offset that allows us to control the instruction pointer. I'd like to use a simple pattern like the alphabet. So I create this exploit and then print that. Now redirect the output of the script into a file, which we then can use as input for GDB. Before we execute the program, let's create a breakpoint at the return of main. And let's define a hook like we have done in previous videos. Define hook stop and we want to display the current instruction that will be executed next. So examine one instruction at the location of the instruction pointer. And then examine eight words as hex from the stack. And end. Then execute it and we hit the breakpoint at the return. The next line shows us how the stack looks like right now. And when we execute the red, we will jump to that address that was on the stack before. So now execute it again with the alphabet. We add the return again and we can see that we have overwritten stuff on the stack. So now we try to return to the address hex 54545454, which obviously is invalid, so we get a segmentation fault. And with examine as string, we can see that we have overwritten the return pointer with t's. So let's update our exploit script. This will be our padding and we create the variable EIP which we can use to control the instruction pointer and jump anywhere we want. And I use struct to create a binary string from the address again, so struct.pack. But where do we want to jump to? We don't have any win function like in the previous levels. Do you have any idea where we could jump to? I think I will give you a second to think about this. Right, we can just jump to the stack where we control data. So obviously we could play some assembler code there. Now let's find a good address. We could just jump right after the instruction pointer we control. To do that just run it again, execute the red and have a look at the stack pointer. So that is the address we want to jump to. And now we have to append code that we want to execute after the return pointer. So why not use the opcode cc, the int3. They were suggested in the channel description. Let's also quickly have a look at the Intel instruction reference. Let's search for int3. Okay, hmm, call interrupt procedure. What else do we find? This table about general exceptions, it calls this instruction breakpoint? Huh? That's interesting. Okay, here's the description of it. Interrupt number three traps to debugger and down here it reads the in3 instruction is a special one byte opcode cc that is intended for calling the debug exception handler. This one byte form is valuable because it can be used to replace the first byte of an instruction with a breakpoint, including other one byte instructions without overriding other code. Whoa, what does that mean? Well, how do you think GDB works? Or any other debugger for that matter? How can you just stop the CPU from executing something or just step one instruction? Actually, a debugger can just use the in3 instruction. Let's make an example. We just created a breakpoint at the thread. What we actually did was we replaced this instruction in memory with int3. And when the CPU reached this instruction, an exception was raised, or in hardware terms, an interrupt got triggered, which stopped the CPU from continuing executing this and called an interrupt handler. 
similar to how the syscall cost an interrupt and exception continued somewhere else. And we can now decide how we want to handle this exception. And if we are the debugger, we could now replace this in 3 instruction again with the original value, the return instruction. That can also be used as an anti-reversing technique, because a regular application will not use the CC instruction. So a malware might constantly scan itself for the CC opcode, and if it finds it, it knows that somebody attached a debugger and tried to set a breakpoint. And now we will use the CC in our payload. Don't forget to write the output of the script into the exploit file, and then test this in GDB. Ok, run again, and we see that we stopped at the red, and we see the address where we would return to. And when we continue now, we pop the instruction pointer value from the stack, thus continuing executing on the stack where we have our n3 instructions. And as you can see, GDB stopped because it received a signal, sig trap, uh, trace breakpoint trap. Cool. This way we know that we have code execution because we successfully injected an assembler instruction. Now, does this work without GDB2? Let's try it. But we get an illegal instruction? That's not what we should see. We should get a breakpoint message. Let's open it in GDB here and try it again. Still illegal instruction. Let's hit the hooks and breakpoint like in the other GDB session. Ok, run. Hmm, the addresses on the stack are not the same. Why are they different? Let's do something crazy. Print the whole stack. I just print a thousand strings or something and let's see what we get. Ok, first we have some gibberish. Let's go further. Ah, see. Now we get some interesting stuff. Let's do the same thing in the other GDB session. This looks like the environment variables. For example, here is the user environment variable that we used in a previous programming video. Hmm. And when you look at these addresses, they are still different. So let's look a bit further down. Hmm. Down here, they are the same. So between here and the environment variables above, there must be something different. When you look closely, you can see that the pwd environment variable, the current working directory, is different. They have different length, so obviously the one execution environment needs more space on the stack to store this path, and thus pushing the stack further up. No wonder that the stack addresses are not the same anymore. So how can we cope with that? There are a couple of techniques that you can use to get a bit more control over the stack, for example by removing all environment variables before executing a binary. But there's another way, a very effective easy trick. Um, and here's a hint. Nope, 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 nope. Right, a knob slide. Let's just add a lot of knob instructions. A knob instruction performs no operation and it has the opcode hex 90. And instead of picking a very specific address, let's just pick one that we hope hits our knobs. So run again and now we can see we have a lot of knobs on the stack. And the address we will jump to just points somewhere else further down. And if you look at more of the stack, we can see that it points almost right in the middle of the knobs. So let's just single step forward and we happily slide down the knob slide until we reach the bottom with our traps. Boom, cool. And that also works now outside of GDB. Now instead of CC, we want to execute something useful. So let's look for some shellcode. As the challenge description said, it's best to reuse shellcode from other people. I really like the collection of shellcode from Shellstorm. Shellstorm has a lot of different kind of shellcode for a lot of different systems. So we are looking for Linux Intel 32-bit shellcode. FreeBSD, Linux on ARM, 64-bit, and here we have 32-bit. They all have a short description and do different stuff, but we are looking for a simple exec.ve that will just execute a shell. So why not take this one? If you look at the assembler code, what it does is just basically pushing some values on the stack, which are in fact just the string that is the path bin as h, and then calls execve. Copy the bytes into the Python exploit script as payload and we can throw it against the program. Hmm, nothing happens. Does it not work? 
Let's add DCC at the start of the payload if, if we still hit it. It should work. Remove the CC again and try it in GDB. Let's single step. We are sliding down the knob slide, all seems fine. And now comes the shell code and it says executing new program bin dash. This first sounds weird, but it's correct. Bin sh just points to bin dash. So why the hell does this not work? Also on a side note, this GDB session is now broken because execve replaces the current program with another one. So stack five got replaced by bin dash. And you can see that when you try to execute it again. So you would have to load stack five again with file. Okay, so, so what's the issue then? This is one of the things I got nuts. When I first got stuck like this, I spent hours trying to figure out what is happening. As much as I want to see anybody else suffer like me, I tell you what the problem is. A shell you execute wants some input, right? From standard input. But we used a program and redirected its standard output into the standard input of this program. And when the program was done, it closed that pipe. So now the shell is executed but doesn't have any input because it's closed. So it will just exit. And there's a neat trick to get basically around that. When you use cat without parameters, it simply redirects its standard input to the standard output. See, like here, you type something in and it gets reflected out. Now you can chain programs together on one line, for example with semicolon. So we can just first print the output of the exploit and afterwards cat is executed so we can enter new input. And if we group that now with some brackets and redirect their combined output into the stack level, the exploit will first run and execute the shell and then cat will take over and we can simply relay input via the cat to the shell. And bam, it works. We have an ugly shell and we can verify our identity with who am I or ID. So now we have escalated privileges to root. Damn, that feels so good. It's just so beautiful.